castellano. Hello, everybody. So we're about to start. Um, to start, I will present myself. My name is Sylvie Barbier. I'm an artist and the co-founder of Life Itself and co-host of Untitled Imaginary Society uh, with Jacques Choplik. Klopchik, sorry. <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy today to welcome you for uh, a conversation with Weston Page on changing the gaze and moving beyond anthropocentric imaginaries. So I will now uh, pass over to my co-host, Jacques, and welcome everyone. Yeah, welcome from my side, Jacques Klopchik. I'm a social psychologist and a facilitator, and I'm really excited about the theme. And we choose it because the imaginaries that fueled Western modernity over the last centuries put humans front and center. But attending to the multiple crises we are facing today, we will, it, we will, it is necessary to move beyond these imaginaries that, and find imaginaries that situate us within the larger webs of life. And this also means that we have to change our gaze the way we look and listen to the world, to other life forms and the modern humans. And in turn, also how we define ourselves within this world as individuals, as societies and as a species. And I'm excited to explore this theme in the next 90 minutes through impulses by our beloved guests, uh, through breakout sessions in which we will explore specific aspects of it and in more interactive, larger group settings where we have questions and answers. On the technical side, we are supported by Petronella and Simran, who will have a look at the chat. Um, so whenever you have a question or a technical topic, uh, just post it in the chat, we will have a look at it. Um, most of us are, after six months of lockdown, quite familiar with Zoom. This might not be true for everybody, but for most of us. So we invite you to add behind your name, to add your location and your preferred pronouns. Um, yeah, I think on the technical side, that is all there is. We are curious why you said yes to show up to this session today. So we invite you just for a short moment, 10, 20 seconds, Think about why did you say yes to this session today and post it into the chat. So I will be quiet for 10 to 20 seconds. Just why did you show up today? <laughs> it's good to have people with a strong yes to, to many different things here in the space. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah, keep it coming. So we'll have this as the backdrop uh, to have our intentions and our curiosities for this session today here. And when Uti and Rope from Untitled Alliance in Demos Helsinki invited us to host the Untitled Imaginary Society, uh, Sylvie and I were putting our heads together and like, who could we invite? And a lot of names came up, but one of the names that came up, or the name that came up right from the start was Western Page. So Sylvie, how come um, this name from the came up. Uh, so first to give a little bit of context, Untitled is an extraordinary alliance of people and organization who are here to really create a different future uh, and to imagine together in a process of 10 year together. And in that uh, we, we set up the Untitled Imaginary Society, which is an online forum for us to kind of 
go in and inquiry about what are the theoretically and livingly for us to kind of think about what would take to have this breakthrough. And um, basically, when I started thinking about who could we invite to dwell in this question, I thought, who best than uh, Andrea and Verena? Uh, so to give a bit of context, I attended one of their extraordinary workshops, uh, which was much more than a workshop. It was a true temporary artistic community uh, during the Venice Performance Art Week. And it was truly the most transformative embodied experience I've ever had. Because these are, they are mastered in creating a context for people to discover their humanity and to create new ways of looking about what it means to be a human being. And as Untitled is a collective act of creation, I thought that would be a privilege to bring other masters at the table and to discuss together. So I'm very, very happy uh, to have Verena and Andrea today. So uh, Andrea and Verena, maybe you can say a little hello so people can see who you are in the collection of image. Uh, thank you for inviting us, uh, Sylvie and Jacques. It's a wonderful opportunity to contribute to this amazing project that you are setting up. We humbly enter <laughs> like in the tip of the toes, you know, uh, and um, our contribution today, we thought not to talk about our art in particular uh, because uh, of the broadness of what Untitled Imaginary Society is. Uh, if we just talk about our art, it could sound a bit of a form of escapism, which we want we don't want to do. Um, so we have a collect a series of thoughts and consideration and hopes, which for us are more hopes, uh, which can fit into the concept of uh, what uh, Untitled Imaginary Society is foreseeing. Uh, so we kindly uh, invite the audience to be patient because uh, these considerations are not just said, uh, they, are, they have been written, so we will read for 10 minutes each uh, what for us is to change gaze in the time, the, the crucial time that we are living. Um, and after that, uh, there will be a short video that we will show and we can then uh, debate together, converse together, talk together about uh, these concerns that we try to keep up, to rise up, and to, to, to find points of convergences, substantially. Yeah, that's, that's the, what, what we hope to do today. Amazing, thank you so much. So uh, yes, we'll start with that artistic intervention. Um, as we want to, this is amazing that online today we can come together and bring your practice to a life form. Um, so please, uh, we'll give you the floor. Yeah, okay. So you start, Verena. Hello, everybody. I'm Verena. Thank you for being here. Um, I will start with reading a text, which Andrea will continue. Um, you can lean back, close your eyes, relax, just let it come to you and flow with the thoughts which are a flow too. Towards the poetic gaze, we have been told and used to feel that art serves to show and tell things we would not otherwise see and hear. But this doesn't seem to be enough anymore. We need to change by questioning not just what being an artist means, but what being human means. So what should be our first step towards this? By making art, I look at the world a world that we have brought to the edge of an emergency, a world strangled by a durable crisis created by us. Now look what we've got, matchboxes for trees and open drains. Is it any longer enough to simply look out at the world? After all, this is a world we have contributed to making. We need to take new responsibilities to change it, 
keeping silence within, be attentive, free from prejudice, to contemplate, to begin a process of liberation. We should find ways to communicate to one each other amidst the ruins and not to continue dancing blatantly on our same corpses. We need to spend on ourselves longer, work deeper, but with challenging ideas. We need to welcome, listen and learn from hundreds and hundreds of us, maybe all this to build a better future. We need to sustain the original poetic voice that each of us carries inside, the one that rises up through the body, carrying raw energy and empathy as it builds. A voice that reveals truths that are horrific to hear. Stories of homelands, forced nomadisms, genocides, massacres, separation. We have this possibility, the one of sharing experiences and creating something new by sharing. A simple act that doesn't cost nothing, but is the essence of life. So to honor this chance, we need to take the courage together to delve into the unspeakable, looking out at the world through our eyes that have seen the depth we can sink to. Speaking it so that your story becomes my story and the other's story so that it can never happen or be darkened up again. To start the change, we must listen to the voices and all those who will follow. Every artist, every activist, every body, for the body is exceptional. As artists, we are in duty to share stories that are urgent and impossible to ignore. How? Let's begin by filling this space, every space, with your voices, your moves, sparking tiny revolutions, feasts, conversations, gazes. The power to make a difference lies within each of us. Every day we die to be reborn again and rediscover ourselves through our own dreams, side by side with our bodies that we try to manage and run, entangling and imprisoning into roles that we have built for them. There is always tension and drama in all this. I explore and determine the relation between my body and my soul, a unity that seems only possible in the realm of utopia, something improbable but not impossible, a last frontier to discover. I recognize my presence in this world through my daily rituals by expressing myself with common gestures as if I were seeking an ideal of circularity. And one day I decided not to see. So I decided not to see, and the question came to my mind. What does it mean to see a little, to see partially, to see freely sometimes, or to choose in peace and tranquility to never see? This forwards a critical issue. It is a question of quantity. To be free to see as much as needed, desired as much as is deserved, being critical of seeing continuously. The vast majority of us can see or is obliged to see from the moment of waking to that of slumber. But then by not seeing one day, I realized I saw the invisible and understood that the invisible is no mystery anymore. Is it real? Is it not real? It is configuration of the things inside and outside, intuitive in harmony. When we don't put our gaze outside and see, I'm told we see ignorant gestures of anger and rage. I'm, I'm told that we are suffocating in houses like boxes imprisoned in cars. We see dumpster cities, mountains in sky in decor, seas like graveyards of plastic, lakes and rivers as poisoning cemeteries, cloistered alleyways and sweeping plains, forests enduring waves of pillage and migrating clouds. We see colors devouring space like people. I'm told of our addiction to screens made in Asia by enslaved children and women in the cellars of factories that at times kill themselves for despair. I'm told that we use an amount of infinite time to lock into our PCs with human interaction reduced to data. I'm told that we are closing our borders and built up walls and that many turn their eyes away when they see a refugee in a bus. I'm told that we continue to judge people by stereotypes, appearance, skin color, gender definitions, dresses, nationality, religion. I'm told that yesterday another village in the Middle East has been bombed by the drones of our countries. They have been doing the same since years and we played as normal while continuing to ask ourselves who the fuck we are laying safe in our couch, catatonically. We see continuously 
this ugly, this beautiful, this dull, this mediocre, marching forth so that we may see more of what is ugly, beautiful, bland, mediocre. We have to oversee, see more, see heaps, because there are events to calculate, mistakes to prevent, situations to control. Therefore, I stop here. Seeing and not seeing, always, never, excluded, seeing sometimes, but what, what, where, what, who. Absurdly, if during the day I'd close my eyes, society would deem me indolent, unfit for progress, to not to see, for a moment, for a little while, for a week, for a year. Do we exist for what we see or for what we actually are? How many ways of gazing do we know? That day I decided not to see, for I realized that to turn my gates inward, I could keep my ideals uncompromised. Despite everything, I still believe that people are good at heart. Anne Frank wrote that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. No one has ever become poor by giving. So now it is time that I listen and learn, for today I am not much less ignorant than I was then. About deportation and the defense of the race theorized by the German Nazi and Italian fascists, about concentration and extermination camps, gulags, mass graves, places born from hatred. About hate as a virus, a social disease arising with violence during social crisis, spreading as the result of frustration and when the ideal of democracy is betrayed. About hate as a collective phenomenon manifesting towards those who are being perceived as different from oneself. About the civil duty to oppose division and violence. So now it is time that I listen and learn, for today I am not much less ignorant than I was then. About what is happening to Afro-American people day by day, about anti-Semitic regurgitations around Europe, anti-immigrant sentiments at every latitude, persecutions of Christians and Muslims, attacks of extremist terrorism, violence of dictatorships, and the policy of terror pursued by governments about the falsehood and disinformation perpetrated by media to favor political groups and ruling classes, about network technology as a useful tool for promoting the culture of dialogue and how hatred sneaks inside the World Wide Web as a livid, as a livid slime, about the battle of opinion on social media, about the notion of network which by definition should unite and connect. So now it is time that I listen and learn for today I am not much less ignorant than I was then. About racism, a black so deeply rooted in our human soul. About slavery, about lands stolen and exploited. About indigenous genocides, about white profit equals white guilt. About history made, unforgivable, unforgivable crimes, systematic stains of hegemonic imperialism. About personal and ancestral traumata that a lifetime is not enough to solve and that our bodies store and carry. About the innocent people who end up in jail without rights, killed by cops. About the effects on the life of those who are subjected to rape, murder, abuse, slavery, lynching, oppressing, and to systemic mass incarceration, legalized police murders, redlining. So now it is time that I listen and learn, for today I am not much less ignorant than I was then about the problem that everywhere in the world there is real horror and deliberately wanted wars perpetuated by wealthy countries' governments to increase their ruling powers, about the widespread co-persecution, genocides, atrocities of vast scale, ruining the lives of millions while devastating their homes and lands, about those policies responding to the hypocritical self-righteousness of us who become accomplices once we pretend that we do not know what is happening and do not take our stance. So now it is time that I listen and learn, for today I am not much less ignorant than I was then. About Libya being a hub of slave markets where black people are bought and sold as property. About concentration camps in China where hundreds of thousands of Uyghur Muslim men are unjustly imprisoned and their women are raped to erase their race. About countries in the Middle East where LGBTQI are thrown off buildings as sinners about Sudan, where Arab militias armed by Western governments killed 300,000 people just not too long ago, about the Iranian government shelling women for 30 years for removing their hijab, about. So now it is time that I listen and learn, for today I am not much less ignorant than I was then. 
about the love of a family, of friends and neighbors, about forgiveness, patience in the trials of life, compassion, self-sacrifice, kindness, and all that serves to improve vision and social development. About the resources of the strength of the mind, body, and vision. About the spirituality, intelligence, grace, solidarity, energy, creativity, eloquence, magnanimity, and humor necessary to continue living for those who suffer for generations. About all those who have never lost hope, even in the face of greatest adversities, and the aspiration for freedom, dignity, civil rights, because for them losing hope was never an option. I gaze time to imagine time. As a body-based performance artist, I understand in my body, the body and its alleged manifestations, physical work, sweat, pleasure, pain, have often been defamed comparatively to the subtle bodies and its alleged manifestations, soul, mind, thoughts, intellect, knowledge. I do not tend to rely as on this separation, for the human body affects cognition. It is an active part of the cognitive process, embodied cognition, the vision of the poet more than the scientist. For a change of what I see unjust in society, I attempt and change myself, gazing into time, my time, considering that what is happening now is a progressive change related to a continuum sequence of events. If I assume continuity between past, present and future, I would simply establish that in reality, the human beings act on hypotheses drawn from experience. The problem is how to justify the fundamental assumption that the future will resemble the past. In principle, it is conceivable that the future may be different from the past. Still, it cannot be established by proofs, since there cannot be no evidence concerning the future, other than the inference from an experience whose validity can otherwise be questioned. Even if historical knowledge and the reading of the present allowed any form of prediction what future should we talk about when the future has not yet arrived? If evidence for a future that exists because we predict it was available, the future would no longer be the future and the evidence would no longer be the evidence. In this sense, the future we are talking about is a future that never comes and of which consequently nothing can be known because it does not yet exist. By withdrawing into such a fate, as a skeptic, I can make my criticism inexpugnable, but I'm not. Reasonably, however, there is a risk in expressing ourselves about a possible future that arrives. A time future in which things happen and the prediction can be verified, even if not in an absolute sense. It can be foreseen this future will be like the past. It is confirmed by the consistent experience of countless positive and negative examples in daily life, history, in the spheres of social, political, and scientific science. Also, it should have a particular specificity, referring to moments already defined over time so that the prediction is made more valid. Even using the frequency as a criterion with which similar events or patterns are repeated. The fact is that this future is precisely here and now. From observing current circumstances, the short-term future consisting of events shaped by those circumstances will resemble the present, made up of the effects of similar cases, which however new can be associated with predicting the near future. Specifying precisely how much time can pass from today to the near future is perhaps impossible. Still, it does not mean that to have any expectation, always present time points towards the future and that, if wrong, they can be corrected. Historical knowledge can allow us to conceive limited but practically useful predictions and anticipations. However, the past experience may be useless as a guide 
because there can be no way of knowing if the future will be like the past and nothing can be learned from history when interpreted by the way to general, since all events are unique. The recent past, present and future are not separable and that in addition to generating concept conceptual frame frameworks of expectation, they contaminate and parts of them coagulate into each other. Why all this to say of an infinite present while being physically distanced as now has become a predominant existential experience? Because to talk of an infinite present, inhabit it, stretch it, we should not escape by take our stance from the fragmented beauty of our violated landscapes and cry out our cry for poetry. We can do so by putting in dialogue our multidimensional biographies, the conceptual and the preconceptual, to extract, to extract matter of more in-depth understanding and discover again that the future is present in the same sense in which the past is present, at least here, at least now, at least imagine. Imagination, it has always been my only savior. Anytime I imagine, I seek and foresee. I imagine, and when I do so, I rely entirely on the, my immateriality, on the immateriality of my visions because they invite me to confront the impossible to make it possible. Dreams that at times come true by human activity processes. To survive to the current situation, since week, a phrase by André Gide in his poetics is coming to my mind. Art begins with resistance, when resistance is overcome. And also the proverb, que la patecala, beautiful things are difficult, repeatedly spoken by Socrates in the dialogues by Plato. Indeed, beauty at least. As a performer, I tend to read beauty as a volatile image to hang on the nail of the nowness, a challenge, a provocation, a trap in which to fall to reclaim new beauty since everything else is a form of waiting, a constraint to get free from, a constraint to get free from and shape our existence to become an act of poetic disobedience and rebellion. As Albert Camus, the author of The Plague wrote, beauty without a doubt does not make revolution, but a day comes when revolution needs beauty. In the age of the digital revolution, and of the ethics adrift for the winds of right-wing populism and nationalism, there is still the chance to create beauty. In times of crisis, to create beauty means never to cease to look for it. Whatever the circumstances, we should inhabit them <clears throat> to then go through them, rediscovering a type of interconnectedness between humans that take precedence over economic and instrumental relations. For beauty may spring from connection formed by sharing a rhythm where our intelligence, sensuality, radical tenderness, dreams of poetic utopias flow together to concretize emerging ideas and fairness and equality necessary for a new planetary harmony. Gazing, recognizing, therefore imagining, it is no escapism nor generalization. Although no imagination helps avert poverty, in reality, none can oppose oppression or sustain those who withstand in body or spirit. And imagination change mentality, however slowly it may go about this. If so, imagine this. Imagine a people, a people of hope, a people of vision. Imagine a people who yearn for knowledge, a people who believe within themselves as well as they believe in everyone else all accepting aspects of one another, progressive open spirits in the love of nature, evidence and compassion. And now imagine this, people driving crazy for that materialistic bullshit, yearning to better an outdo, trying to succeed, even when the concept of success has surpassed. Get a grip, take a grasp. People whose lives are built on rage or on science or a systematic stain. Delayed evolution requires a revival. Imagine death. Can you picture it? It is like staring at the sun. You can only gaze it into. It, you, you can only gaze into it at eyes closed. So then imagine life now. 
what does it look like into your eyes? To change gaze, to attempt and contribute for a change in society, may start to understand that modern identity is no longer fixed for the increasing awareness and appearance of mixed society, for example, with the growing awareness and identification with diversity in countries, tradition, values, and beliefs. Structural change has been transforming modern society in fragmented cultural landscapes of class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, race, and nationality. The postmodern self has no stable inner core. It is not fixed in any way, but instead form and transform continuously according to the ways it is addressed to represent, it is addressed or represented in society. It is a self in process, defined historically rather than biologically, containing contradictory identities that pull in different directions. This process puts significant stress and responsibility on the individual and his choices in life. The mashup of cultures means identities have become detached from specific times, place, histories, and tradition. It is harder to reflect on ourselves with the new possibilities and the heritage we do have, and it becomes dualistic. This makes us fragile in creating our identity. It is a current opinion that an individual can only develop a real sense of identity in the context of a social group through interaction with others. Self and reflection on ourselves emerge from social interaction formed within society. However, if I don't define myself for myself, I would be crushed into each other's fantasies of myself and eaten alive, as poet and civil rights activist Audre Lorde once wrote. Yet, is my identity whatever I want to be? Is it only subjectively defined or is it shaped by more complex cultural negotiations? From the I and the me into the we and the us. To have a sense of ourself, the I can reflect on the me that represent the behaviors and attitudes formed by interaction with others. To have a sense of ourself in the community and society, we can reflect on us that represent the behaviors and attitudes formed by interactions with other groups. When we talk of valuing fundamental human rights, addressing the cultural heritage and the potential that each community has, we indeed speak of freedom, integration and equality. Yet, the many problems we are facing today are because we have shown incapable of embodying and enacting what we say we believe and that was already stated in the 1948 Universal Declaration of the Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Everyone is entitled to the all rights and freedoms, including race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinions, national or social origin, property, birth, or another status. Furthermore, no distinction shall be made on the political, jurisdictional, or international status of the country or territory to which a person belongs, whether it be independent, trust, not self-governing, or under any other limitation of sovereignty. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. So why we have come to this heartbreaking point? We start with high hopes, then we bottle them, for sooner or later we realize that we are all going to an end without finding out a reason why. We develop long-winded ideas without radically stretching, extending our body of practical learning to dig into the actual constitution of the existence and perceive its essence. I may know my past, but I can't foretell my future. The future is in my back, my history is in front of me. So I harbor the tension and expose it to you, not to cover them again, but to externalize, contain, because you are the other face of me and I am the other face of you. The crack in the house of history that opens open up so the water can pass through the scars of ancestral territories. 
I'm not speaking out of anybody else's truth, for I am nothing, carrying few dreams with, with and inside of me, without being them. I am in a body that is mine, and I'm not the primeval we, but a body, by nature radical, as any other body is. If we dig to the roots, we are all entry points, one story that becomes many. I, you, he, she, they, we, is still universal. In the ambience of life, we become sore. You are damned if you don't do, and you are damned if you don't recognize and expect to be accepted. There's so much we don't know about, so it's time to stop to play everything all normal. Life is a minefield where it is necessary to go beyond each physical action to honor it fully. And what do we want to create from here? System wants us to believe in all that sort of well-packaged lies so they can control us to drag us down to a level of social, sexual, spiritual, intellectual, inoffensive mediocrity. We wander in countries of failure, colonized by unscrupulous wankers. We give them out our homes and homelands to us their deadly weapons in the name of elusive temporary protection, accepting their sickening ideas of a new world order shaped on purpose to create modern slavery and division among us people. What does that make us? Say you have a home to live now. However, you are still standing up in your body by the hypocrisy propagating around you. For instance, when it shouts in, in the face of those who are running away from wars and starvation that they are all potential terrorists. So where can they breathe? But we continue to say that we are okay. Everything is going to be all right while we are humming against our fears. Be careful, don't speak with him. He's a gypsy, an immigrant, an illegal alien, a refugee out of nowhere, or a third league scum bucket country. Send him back home. Don't you have a house? No, I don't. It has been raised to the ground, my children all dead, blown up. Are you baptized? What is your religion? What is your nationality? What is your ethnicity? Mark his passport, rejected. Let him rot in a dumb wet and dribbling and dumb jail. What is an identity? My pain, my guilt, but my sin comes from where? Can we talk about hope, beauty, home, white guilt, white shame? Let's talk about restriction. Let's talk about not being able to move in a damn bleak prison, unable to prove innocence. But we continue to philosophize about freedom. My freedom is your freedom. No, my freedom ends where your freedom starts. Or let's talk about fear, or fear of sensing fear fear of being truly free, fear of touching the unknown, fear of despair, fear of nothing making a connection, fear of living, fear of having no potential, fear of my heart because it's too tender, fear of looking into your eyes of losing something, fear of touch and of being touched, fear of time ticking, fear not being able to breathe, fear of moving, fear of smiles and tears. Give it a trajectory, a luminous trail, scratching with your fingers into the fissures and the cracks of the bricks where our fear is sleeping, a snake called in its liars, a spore near the opening, uncoded, not labeled, fear as a medium, not as a message. The cycle of trust springs from the base of my spine all the way forward. What we call the beginning is often the end. So point to one end, which is always present. Footfalls equal in response to space. I can only say there we have been, but I cannot say where. The end and the beginning were always there, and it was not what one had expected for its all complexity today and no consistency. At the end of this exploration, we will arrive where we have started for a place, a home, is which was the beginning. Although there will always be someone who will say, you can't, play it safe. You can't mix this with that, but you will and yet we see still flows in the system. Many of us didn't go to sleep hungry last night, didn't go to sleep outside, had a choice of what clothes to wear this morning, didn't spend a minute in danger, have access to clean water, medical care, the internet. We can read, we have the right to vote. And yet modernity promise the freedom from fear now lies in ruins. Fear as medium, not as a message. Fear as collateral effect, the force behind the others. Fear to take a chance, scoring the aces. Fear that plays and wins, caressing, embarrassing. Fear manages, fear rocks. Give it a face, a symbol. Science lines, 
voice glued on the wall, which animates and gives evidence. Fear along the lines, undefined by boundaries. Physical, drawn, etched, carved, actual bodies and imaginary forms. I try to identify the cavity, the ravings, the corner where my fear was sleeping. An, in an independent entity capable of self-production, regeneration, diffusion, crossing thresholds, filtering secret places, metamorphic, crystallizing cracks of walls, residuals, mutable, an anomalous gap between the rails, unexplored, not encoded, hard to label. Where did the I am here kind of map go missing? It was never there when I grew up. And now look what I've got. Bethlehem, Gaza, Aleppo, Kashmir, Laza, so many places guarding against. And so now it's time I listen and learn. For today, I'm not much less ignorant than I was then. I just want to embrace this moment of silence after this meditation on so many things, beauty, fear as a medium, and I cannot name the different topics that you put us through. So I will just take a moment of silence before we will show just a short snippet of one of your works that we also have the chance after um, the conversation and the breakout that follows to watch. It's a 20 minute movie. We will edit at the end. Um, we will now show three minutes of it. And then we will have some time, 10 minutes in very small groups, three people to reflect on what is resonating now with you. I had a few moments where I got shivers. Um, maybe this is different for every one of us. So Petro, can I ask you to, to show the movie mm -hmm. or the first part of it? Je suis malien, je viens du Mali. Moi, j'étais un grand maçon de mon pays. J'avais beaucoup de marchés. Un jour, j'ai pris les marchés de construction d'un grand bâtiment. Ce jour-là, mes hommes et moi, on devrait faire la toiture. On a pris tous les matériaux nécessaires. On a mélangé le ciment. Mais soudain, il y a eu un changement de climat. Et tout a basculé. J'ai pris du sachet, mes hommes et moi, pour essayer de couvrir, pour diminuer les dégâts. Mais ça n'a pas marché. Et tout le travail qu'on avait fait était ruiné. Donc, pour éviter la prison, j'ai décidé de m'enfuir. J'ai pris le car pour Gao, qui est une région du nord du Mali. Le Gao à Algérie, les rebelles nous ont attaqués. Ils ont pris tous nos biens. Quand je suis arrivé en Algérie, j'ai commencé à travailler grâce à un certain temps. 
de Algérie, j'ai pris la route pour Libye. Et à Libye également, j'ai commencé, je travaille à un certain moment. De Libye, j'ai pris la route pour l'Italie. Ici en Italie, je me sens en sécurité, un problème d'intégration. Ça, je ne fais pas du théâtre, mais c'est une réalité de ma vie. Thank you. As I said, after um, we finished the official 90 minutes, maybe a bit longer, we will have the chance uh, to see the whole movie. We will now break for 10 minutes in groups of three. And you have the chance to just reflect what, what after you introduce yourself, what bubbles up now for you, what resonates now for you, what's present. And to think if there are responses you have in your groups of three or some questions, we will have time to go a little bit in an interaction after the breakout. So let it sink in. I feel for me it's still sinking in. And enjoy what comes, comes up, up in the dialogue, dialogue and how others listen to this, how others, in which gaze you all looked at what you, or you all listened to what you just heard. So enjoy, and we will meet back in around 10 minutes. Yeah. Mm Does anyone need help to join their breakout room? Mm. Oh, some, 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 some. <laughs> mm. What? That means you're, you're unmuted. I'm unmuted, yes. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's So and Marianne. Do you need help? Unmuted. No, but <laughs> she can, people can listen through my. No, maybe not. Marianne, so? Mm. 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 
Charlie's there. Charlie's there. No, Charlie says, there's a girl in our room, but her mic isn't working. Can you move her, please? Her name is Chelsea. They won't say girl in Chelsea name. Charlie, Charlie is back here. Oh, yeah. Ah, so Chelsea needs to be moved to another room. Charlie yeah. needs to be put back in another room because Charlie's out of his room. Then he's out of No, no, no. Chelsea, your mic doesn't work, so we need to put you in a different room. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ah. it, um, it. Oh. Oh, no, your mic. Nice to meet you, Charlie. Nice Chelsea. to meet you, too. Um, the other persons didn't work. Got it. Well, yeah. I don't know if uh, we'll try to put I you. Know. We'll try to put you in another room. You need to accept. Yeah. Uh, you just need to accept the invitation. Thank you. Okay. Great. So let's say five more minutes, and then we get yeah, we get so them back. Two minutes before the end. There hasn't been five minutes yet. Yeah. We how much do we have? Five, four and a half. We have now. Yeah, but then we might be in my room. Ah, on your, yeah. okay, good. Mm -hmm. Andrea. Andrea. Hello? Hello? No. Hello? Good. Yeah. Okay, no, no echo. No. Can you hear us fine, Andrea? I wanted to ask you both if we thought to the text you, the both texts that you read that we can share uh, with people. Like is great. Oh, there's Will and Chelsea. They are still not in their breakout rooms. Yeah, sorry. The, it kept sending me in and out. Um, uh, William, Will, we can't hear you. Sorry, um, it kept sending me in and out, and so I just logged off and then came back in again. Got it. We'll try our best to send you, but otherwise we can hear be the, the, some of us like maybe share ourselves what we got from the reading of the text. Um, you're the privileged one with the artist themselves. <laughs> So um, I heard, I was just letting it wash over and then, um, you know, I'm here in the United States and of course, I'm in basically the epicenter of it in Louisville, Kentucky. This is where Beyond Taylor was murdered. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's very new, it's real, it's like out in my community, but one of the things that stuck out in the lecture as a performance lecture in my eyes was I didn't know that you all were underground resistance fans from Detroit. <laughs> and I heard the lyric like wrapped in from Make Your Transition. And that is a very important track in um, techno for those who are listening. Um, here in the Midwest, you know, we're really familiar with um, Midwest techno. So it was really beautiful to hear that language of oppression, which is underground resistance is, that's the sound of it in Detroit, you know? So that's what one of the, I was blown away in that moment. Um, I was, it also reminded me of um, poetry that it almost was like defying time. Like the way the words were just washing over me felt like I was transporting through time, backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And so the movement was taking me backwards and forwards. I'm not sure if like, it was like, oh, they just mentioned underground resistance. I'm in the speaker <laughs> or if it's something else. So that was my really quick overview. And I was like, oh, I need to make a performance lecture myself. So I have that noted here, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm very excited to be in this room with you. <laughs> uh, I can, uh, Chelsea, I can tell you something. I mean, these are 
um, these texts that we have or ordered are part of several texts that uh, we have written a, a long time in different countries together with other friends. Uh, one of them is actually watching us, you know, so uh, it is not that uh, last week or last month when Sylvia invited us, we started to write it and we thought which kind of text that we have uh, wrote in the past years and which part of this text could fit in the purpose of uh, United uh, Imaginary Society, Untitled Imaginary Society. So the, 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 the things that is circulate, the circularity on time is a good observation. Uh, and Will, Will, I don't know if there's something you would like to share from your experience. Yeah, it was, um, it was making me think of uh, how being pulled towards something. Um, so the, the idea, the image of the sun and, and looking towards that as though that is, you know, is death. Um, and that constant wish to look towards something else that, that isn't right now um, and that drive that feel it's like an impatient energy to, to constantly look look away but it's towards something which almost hurts more so it's like where does the where do you actually what gaze can you can you fix on because everything hurts at the moment um, uh, there's so much pain and so much and, and even anything which is beautiful feels so intensely beautiful because it's because all this pain is around it that it's it's almost it's just like that's too much as well. Um, so yeah, that's what I was feeling from that, and I was just like, how do I? Part parts of my brain was going, how do I distract myself from listening to this? Um, and I was like, oh no, just 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 listen to it. You don't actually have to do anything right now, um, and actually just close uh, yeah and close my eyes and lie on this floor, which is why I've ended up here to to be able to listen to it and so yeah thank you so much for, for sharing that thank you we have about one minute before the rest of the group join you come everyone is coming in now wonderful Hi, so I is there two people who would like to maybe share what they got for themselves out of this meditative artistic experience um, that they would share with the larger uh, group. I see several of them. And you can, I don't know how people are familiar with uh, Zoom, but you can uh, raise your electronic hand um, and just unmute yourself. Well, in that case, if we have shy souls, well, I'll hand over to you, Jacques, for our Q&A part. Um, so just one moment. Shall I hold? Yeah, that was good. Yes. I think people uh, can hear me. So uh, yeah, maybe if there's uh, nothing to share yet in this context, um, maybe there are questions regarding what we heard. Mm, and yeah, you can raise your 
your hand, we will see it. Um, if not, I think we have questions. But if people, two. you can yeah. also write in the chat questions that you might want to ask to the artist, and we'll try to select a few of them um, that we might uh, have the opportunity to ask Verena and Andrea. And we have prepared some questions we would love to ask you both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe we start with one. Um, I think imagination and vision is often so much tied to the eye and to projecting our view, not to look at something. Uh, but your work, Andrea and Verena, entails so much work with the body, and it was also very important in, in what you read or what you shared with us. Um, Verena, why is it so central to your work to work with the body? Or I don't know, we, when we prepared a bit, I was not sure which pronoun to, or which connecting word to use, work through the body or work with the body. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure which question, how to ask this question properly. Good, good point. The, uh, what are we inside? Are we with it? Are we through it? Well, basically, yes, we're performance artists, so the body is artistically our instrument. Beyond that, we believe also strongly in the body as an instrument of knowledge making. There is this beautiful uh, metaphor uh, from the Hindu scriptures that considers the body as a chariot. Maybe you have already heard about that. And, and I often come back to, to think about that even when, we, when it's about our work because it composes the, the elements of the, of the intellect, the mind, the senses and the body and puts them all in relation with each other in this beautiful image of, of the body being the chariot which is being guided by the self basically uh, through the intellect and the mind which is the reins and the senses to come back to the eye which are the horses that are actually pulling it off. So it, it is Im impossible to think uh, of one of the other separate from each other. This is what, what personally is important for me in the performance practice. So <laughs> is somebody to ask him? No, I think it's um... huh? It was background noise. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so we, this, the notion of, or the, the working through body, and also untitled is an alliance. It's a coming together of, of organizations, of people to co-construct. And one of the first texts I was really touched by that you shared with us in the preparation was the notion of a temporary artistic community where you bring together artists and non-artists to, to co-create together. This is a departure from the image of the artist as a lonely genius. Uh, it's really a collaborative practice. So maybe you can share a bit why this collaboration or this co-creation is so central for you and for what you do. Because exactly of this that you have said, uh, that uh, the, the speaking of anthropocentrism, no? if I relate it to the figure or the idea of the artist uh, alone as epicentrum in the world, uh, it is something that it doesn't suit to us at all. Uh, of course, there are a lot of time that we, uh, or even alone, we spent in our studio to, to conceive, to think, but when it's a moment of put things into practice, I cannot do without the fact that my being exists when it is in relation with other beings. And that everything uh, makes sense when beings entities and when I say beings I don't just say human beings but also objects uh, space time 
uh, interface and intermingle with one another. Uh, and in that moment, uh, the poet would say magic happened, but it's not, oh, let's read it as magic because it's always surprising. There is a, a flow of energies that by chance, by conflicts, contracts or harmony, they create something uh, which is surprising all the time and which is not foreseeing a priori. And this is what I, I intend as a beauty of making art, uh, which is uh, a, a little, uh, how to say, a little box that give me also hope that if society would be as such, you know, that in that moment, okay, our responsibility is to create a space, a temporary space for these encounters to happen. And when the encounters happen, then there is a dynamics. Uh, and as because we are there to make art, of course, then there is the, 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 the art, the a kind of art that springs. Uh, but the same, you know, in my utopist, utopistic vision um, would be uh, in the day, every, our everyday life in, in society, in conceiving new systems, no, uh, not even system, but conceiving new, new way of living, as you are doing also. You know? so that, that's what we try to do. And of course, it's a very short span of time because we don't have the facilities to make it longer than two weeks. But from the very first day when like 70 people come, artists, non-artists comes and share this uh, space and experience and they live together for two weeks, then a family rise up. So they also the concept of family is expanded. It's not the normative family that we are used to think of, okay? Uh, which I don't want to criticize at all because I also am part of a normative family, so to say, although we live in a different way uh, from the normative. But uh, it is like going back to the concept of the tribe of being together around the fire and telling our stories. Also that we now have, although we now have not anymore the fire, but we have tech devices or whatever, you know, that but the concept is the same the stick you know the stick is not so different from the laser ray yes thank you so much andrea and, and it, i really wanted to jump in because for me being part of one of those experience why i wanted you guys here was that i think to in the practice here of untitled imaginary society if, for us to really imagine a radically better future it requires first for us to come together differently. And we are very used to maybe come together uh, with our intellect, with our ideas, but a lot less used to come with our body and with our being and, um, and to create a space uh, where we can experiment, truly experiment radically differently of what it means to come together about imagining differently. Um, and, and I guess one of my big question, and it's a huge question, and so we might need to kind of like try to condense that, which is, it seemed to me very clear that you guys had an uncommon view of what it meant, to, what it means to be a human. Because it's, I think in uh, maybe the dominant view of society is being a human often is like we're fixed things. Like, I can't change. The world can't change. And in this exercise of saying, hey, let's imagine a different future, it comes with a presumption that transformation or something else is available. And I can sense that in your practice and even in uh, what, the way you delivered your artistic experience and, and community is that you are standing for unknown future. And I guess my question is to come to that is, what is your deep view on what it means to be a human being? <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Uh, historically speaking, we have always faced as uh, human beings uh, a major problem. When a society is born, then by 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 chance or by circumstances, a group of powers emerge. It was like this in the Middle Ages, for example, how a king is born. A king is born because he has a, a stick that is bigger than the other, and he gets to take his territory. That that's that's it. No. So there is always something that is connected to possession. Uh, I believe that when we uh, radicalize ourselves and we really, uh, as Verena said in her text, uh, uh, we have to not give away what we have. What we have, what we have is giving. So if we don't possess what we give, already we can make a change into ourselves. And if someone uh, start to make it, uh, and the other sees that it's not so difficult, then things can slowly change. Uh, another factor for me to, to, to deepen the, the question of the human beings, and I've written this little that we should accept that there are many things that we do not understand and we won't understand them never, never. Uh, I don't want to say that uh, with the analytical mind, we, we, with the analytical mind, we can understand many things, but then the analytical mind, and this, and this Jacques can help me because he's a psychologist, with the analytical mind that when we solve or discover thing, we create immediately cognitive schemas. And cognitive schemas are made to dominate things. But then there are things that escape our domain, dominion. Uh, Timothy Morton speaks about hyper objects that are so powerful, like, you know, the, the climate change. You know, whatever we can do, we cannot decide what nature wants to do. Because if nature get angry because of us, we cannot control nature. It's impossible. When an hurricane came, you cannot control it. So there are things that are above us all the time, but we presume that we can fix everything, as you said. So this uh, being of, uh, this being presumption, assuming that we can do everything is completely wrong. It's a mistake. Yeah. And so we should accept that all the difference, all the differs also between us can give us other mode, modes of learning to exist. Yes. And we should accept that the difference is important without measuring that difference, not to an ideal scale and comparing and making judgments because then we create a hierarchy. And this is the problem of the Western thought. It is years, centuries, that the Western thought has improved by creating hierarchies. And this is what we are living exactly today. A small, a small invisible particle has made a mess on us. No, uh, completely changed things. It's not a man or an army that has changed things. It's something that we presume to control, but that we cannot. Yeah. And which relates back for me to the concept of gaze we had. Um, like the gaze as the expression of a schema trying to fix the world. No? Yeah. Like the exactly. The world. exactly. Oh. And, and, and uh, well, I mean, we have been lucky a bit. I had lived uh, with Verena last year, uh, which she had a very uh, problematic uh, disease. I mean, I can say it. Uh, yeah. You're saying it. <laughs> yeah. She got the TBC, that is an invisible bacteria inhabiting the lungs that sometimes it can awake for 
we don't know why why we don't know why I think the, the, when you leave this disease you understand that you are together with multiple uh, invisible beings in subsistence you are living together with them yes you have to recognize this condition i wanted to maybe jump in and ask actually ask specifically because what you're pointing to which is like oh there's you and then you coexist with other organism mm -hmm. and maybe more specifically to verena because you were touched by the disease what does moving beyond anthropocentric imagery means to you um, in your practice as an artist and as a human being? Mm. <laughs> well, crossing the two questions, maybe, uh, because, because on the point with the human, I'm, I'm probably more pragmatic than Andrea. Uh, maybe because of the experience of the disease, maybe of other uh, belief schemes or systems, uh, which is like human, human is, and that there we also come to the anthropocentrism. I think human is uh, a biological, physical phenomena, uh, a very, very complex one, a very, in, in, in best case, very beautiful one. Um, but then again, strip it down. This is uh, once the pathogens make me realize that, that I'm so much uh, biophysics. My thoughts are biophysics, as a consequence, my body, it is. Then we can speak about the higher self or the spiritual side of it. Everyone might have their own ideas about that. But on the plane of, of being, uh, the, this is where it comes down to. And this is where anthropocentrism comes in for me. If, as soon as I'm able to admit that, mm, I admit that I'm just as equal to matter and substance and whatever matter substance and nature can produce so if if nature and substance can produce spirit or thought or soul or consciousness then probably i'm not much different i'm like this is not much different this human being is not much different than uh, anything else i see and experience around me and this is what we in our artistic practice often come to so we we try, if we work in live performances, our aim is always to approach everyone as the other face of me. And when I come to work in, uh, for our films, mostly we, we work with nature or so-called objects, uh, which we try to approach in exactly the same way, because they can tell me the, a lot of stories too. And they can be a good partner for, for art making too. But I need to step beyond that idea of me being in control or me being more important or me having to say more. Uh, uh, there we come again to the thing of listening, right? Wonderful. I wanted to maybe open the floor for our audience to see if anyone would have some question they would like to ask directly to Western Page. Uh, and if not, we also had a few from the chat. Yes, Helen, you can unmute yourself. Uh, I just wanted to thank you. I'm in the UK, near Cambridge, in the UK. And I just wanted to thank you for, I wasn't expecting to be sort of quite so dumbstruck as I have been. And I just was reminded of the power of art when we speak truth, when we through whatever medium we have and how powerful and necessary that is, particularly at the moment. And, and so I thank you for, for bringing me to that realization. I just tuned in, I thought this looks interesting and whew, there it was. Um, and the, the power of your words and the way that you are and how you are talking about the, the, the sort of power that art can bring us to. Um, when, when there is that skill, that is much needed to bring us and bring an audience, uh, bring the relationships that we have to that point of realization. What do you then do with that? Because that is a really, in, in all the noise that is going on around us, that is such a valuable, it feels like such a very, very valuable thing to be able to do. 
And so I, I guess I don't know that this is just my thoughts out loud. Where do we go if we have that skill? Um, where do we then take that? Or we, do we just bring it to the world, offer it as a gift? And through platforms like this, we're able to connect, we're able to gather strength as a community to be able to amplify that because it feels like we can't trust technology. We can't trust those channels which were trusted. So uh, art speaks to truth to me. That is the definition of art. So yeah, I don't know. That's just where it left me. That's where I am at the moment. Where do we take it? If we can bring people to that realization. Wonderful. So where do we take this gift? Verena and Andrea, where do we take the gifts? Okay, uh, so <laughs> well, it's quite, you know, I, I can't, I, I can't foresee the future in a way. I, I, I can say what I feel now in a way. Uh, uh, it, Maybe I don't want to use the word power because it's always a bit, it is, of course it is power, but when we use, okay, uh, we have to focus, Ellen, in, okay, we have to be attentive. We have to focus all the time on language, identity, space, history, knowledge, knowledge production. And it's very complex now, and it's, uh, there are many things that escape our control continually. Even to the greatest poet and the greatest philosopher, they escape in a way when we try to embody them and enact them then in real life, in the everyday life. Um, what I do believe is that uh, art is a tool, first of all, and we are the tool of art. So we artists are the tool, tool of art and I don't have to look for consent or Sussex, or whatever make, whatever feed my ego, which I need as a, as a very small human being. You know, it's good when these things happen. But if I embody the fact that I do art to produce an open space of relation, which I am in, I am into it also because I need to relate to the others, and the art that I do is maybe my language to relate with the other. And if some other is infected or positively contaminated, and I vice versa from a member of the audience, for example, what comes after is the most beautiful thing. It's maybe a friendship. And this happened quite some time in our artistic mm -hmm. path. And this is what, why we are here today with Sylvie, for example, you know. So that from a participation that she did uh, three years ago, now we are here to share even deeper thoughts that we had at that time. And this is beautiful. And this is beautiful for me, for Belen and I. You know? So this is the power of continuing Continue. And let me please add that because I was waiting also for the point to say it. Um, it is a, a continuum. It's a perpetuum mobile. I, I absolutely believe in that because the last years of our works have shown that. So again, what you have, we have said it in our room. So maybe it's nice now to say or important to say to all what we have read, big parts of it, not all, but big, big parts is, is texts that have been written collectively what we call collective poetry. They have been created in the temporary artistic communities, in workshop sessions, in moments in which we were jamming and one of us was writing down more elements where we thought these are brilliant, but the person isn't even realizing what wisdom they carry because they're in the flow of speaking. And, and all that we did was collecting it, editing it, and asking also for the permission to continue working with that and the same can do the persons who have contributed and taken part in these things. So it's a continuous becoming. This wisdom, what you have heard now, is, is, is not just grown in, in our heads. Of course, Andrea is a brilliant writer and uh, I put my little part of it inside too. But a lot of this is, is growing through being and making and it continues. It continues. In, in, in a way, it's like, okay, uh... We are like collectors of little grains of dust because they, we don't 
want that they get spread in the universe, you know, and so we try to collect them and... And, and this is why together. they are so strong. Uh, uh, so, so we can write strong poetry, but these poetries, these collective poetries have a particular strength that goes straight to the heart because they come from many hearts. And, and, and something always reaches someone. Uh, they come from different cultural backgrounds, from different life experiences. There's so much in it. For example, the perspective that I read about time and how to gaze uh, the present time and to stretch it as an infinite present and not just foreseeing the future, predicting the future. Uh, it is something that uh, I, I, I explored thanks to a friend of mine that is 27 years old from UK. You know, he's a queer artist, a beautiful queer artist. They are, sorry. And, and, and uh, yes, and then it, it opened me a, a, a new kind of vision about time. Yeah. Wow. Um, the beauty of it is I wouldn't know where your question would have taken us, Helen. And I think with every question, we open new doors and doors and doors. And I have to admit, I'm very touched by the sharing, personally, like it's, um, it's very beautiful. At the same time, well, and I believe we could open this wider and go deeper. At the same time, we also want to honor the time we set for ourselves uh, in terms that we're closing this, this session. We will show the full part of the video after. Um, but at this point, I will hand over to you, Sylvie, to, to um, yeah, well, try to find like a good temporary closure for whatever is happening here. Yes. I think maybe Andrea or Verena, do you have one last thing you would like to say? You know, we, maybe you know. We, we respond quickly to the questions I see in the chat. Yes. What, yeah. do, you, what do you think? If you see there, just to um as as quick as we can so uti is asking uh since i saw smh introduction saying have worked together for over a decade i've been wondering how did you come to work together um life was blessing us <laughs> with this opportunity for who doesn't know we don't just work together we're also married since 10 years so it's really a constellation of the stars <laughs> that make this beautiful thing. And we've met, we come from different backgrounds in theater, visual arts, um, philosophy, writing, makeup artistry. And I have been living in Berlin, working for a festival organization. Andrea arrived with his theater company to play at that festival. It was a theater company of so-called social theater in Italy, which includes differently abled uh, people. The festival was also of that that theater kind of uh, kind of theater, and there I met this group and this man, and uh, it was love on first sight. And when we started to live together, we also started to work together. We both didn't make performance art before, so what we do now has really just grown uh, with with being together, with working together. Okay, yeah, yes. Uh, for Ch and, Chelsea, yeah. uh, uh, very, very quickly. Uh, Chelsea asking, yeah, about do books. you have titles of one to three books for us to read? Uh, for philosophy and how to see the future in a post anthropocentric imaginary, I suggest Timothy Morton. You can scout on, uh, you can see all the titles he has written and choose, you know, dark ecology or uh, hyper objects or other things, or you find a lot of things on the internet too. And um, about uh, pandemics and things like that, uh, there is this title that is White Fragility. I have the EPUB, so I can send it to Sylvie and then Sylvie can share it. And another one which is why I'm no longer talking about race with white people. So these are book quite, they say quite controversial, but you know, it's, um, it's uh, good to, to, to read them. And also Audre Lorde, which is a poetess, black poetess, 
uh, Edouard Glissant, uh, Poetic Hope Relations is very important. There, I have read two parts of him, two, two paragraphs, two, two sentences of him also. And um, another one Slowly, is- Why am I not going to say Edouard Glissant? The second one, I missed the second one. Ah, White Fragility. White Fragility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I have the EPUB, so I can send it to Sylvie, so Sylvie can share it to you all. <laughs> And then, uh, uh, yeah, and Toni Morrison. I mean, I, I'm in love with this beautiful black ladies writer. She's fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I, I will then uh, close this wonderful session. I, I really want to acknowledge you both for the extraordinary stand that you both are to really create a space for a different future to arise and to not let the past keep coming up uh, because it does take a stand to let the future come to us uh, rather than us polluting the future mm -hmm. with our past. And um, you guys are so wonderful to be around. And I want to also really thank you for our extraordinary audience with the patience and the listening that you have offered and finally, I really want to say a massive thank you to Uti and Rupa for us to give this platform and created this wonderful initiative to start this extraordinary conversation. And if um, any people are interested in uh, being more engaged with Untitled, you can go to the website untitled.community. Uh, we'll just put it on the chat. And we'll now play a 20 minute video of what we saw earlier of the clip. If you need to go, please drop off. And if you have the time, please stay on. We'll just pl play the video um, through sharing screen. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, finally, maybe one, if you want to say one last thing, Farina Andrea, otherwise, um, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everybody. That's the moment for us to really be grateful for Untitled uh, and for life itself and all the people behind it. Thank you for creating this space, virtual, but very, very human. And everyone who was here, we really hope to meet you in this world in real. So let's keep connected. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I just say that I, we have chances and choices. Uh, Relations can put up in, to contrast and violence, but if you think that relations is a, a fantastic way of chemical osmosis between human beings and between uh, the world, then we can maybe aspire to contribute to a change, a positive change. Each one in his own way, their own way, their own way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll, Petronella is about to share the video. Uh, bye everyone and we'll just share the video and we can all watch together.
je suis retourné dans mon pays pour venir regarder mes enfants. Et après, j'ai pris la route pour le Burkina. Le Burkina, je suis allé au Niger, aussi la Libye. Ça, c'est une autre vie.
Basta hindi kung day man, day man, man, so pasang hindi sa mga siya na ito pala dito pa. Ito po ang sobrang itang nag-issue ito. Abang doon sa telepono na dito po lang, matipig na po rin higit si Basha Tito. Ni Tito rin mo dito, matipig na dito po rin higit si Amide Kichi. Para ito sa region, yan mo dito sa Bangladesh siya sa region, Afrika may si Pacho. Amin tadi suri dia pun muka pun tak terpakai ni, ni dia suri dia. Kan terbicar mesti kau licar macam ni, amin dia kisi, amin mesti, amin dia kisi. Ni kat dekat lagi amal cukup lah, lah untuk kau licar. Kau licar sokal bela, muru pun ni ni dia tu, jekan dia pun bali bawa. Ini semua ini licar tu kau licar, kau licar suri kau licar. Euro, dollar, dinar, dan sekiranya. Kami boleh cipta. Kau ingin aja amat ikut apa boleh cipta. Kamu harus tak kau boleh sih ikut sama kerja kamu tak kau boleh sih. Tapi bisa sekali lagi. Amat kerjaan soal ini lencuk kau ini soal sama ni tak boleh dekat sih. Tapi kamu bicu mukti kamu tak bicu dekat sih. Tahu jangan amat ikut cari mana itu cari mana. Pisto de Buddha, Pundo de Buddha, Latita por. Uno cabal de mí, uno cabal de mí, a mi chollo de pan y pan por el sí. Por una madre, por el chito de lo que el mando me doy a la otra cara. A mi policía, a mi que la otra cara, por una otra cara no carna y chico y yo de. तो फिर नालंग कर से अमेरिकी बात तो ना कोई है माय गॉड हेल्प मी है माय गॉड हेल्प मी है माय गॉड हेल्प मी प्लीज 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 अमेरिका बात चीना तो फिर ना मेरी शिष्य ने अमेरिका लिबिया ते तक बोला मैं मोले मोरो पानी के शागोरे अमित चोली जाए तो जी माय गॉड अमेरिका हेल्प कर चीना لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ملك ولا الحمد وحده لا كل شيء قدير ربنا أتنا في الدنيا أصنا وخير إرادة أصنا وخير أزوانا
Tu veux que c'est moi, c'est à côté de lui. Si la personne est quelque chose, c'est moi, je vais voir. C'est à côté de ça, moi, je ne suis pas parti à l'école. Après, j'ai perdu mon papa. Le grand-père de mon papa, il est venu prendre tout l'héritage de mon père. Ma maman n'a pas accepté. Parce que si ma maman a accepté que le grand-père de mon papa vient prendre l'héritage, elle n'aura pas quelque chose pour nous nourrir. Parce qu'il n'y a pas quelqu'un pour aider ma maman à s'occuper de nous. Toujours, ma maman fait parler avec ce monsieur à cause de l'héritage de mon père. À cause de l'héritage de mon père, ils ont tué ma maman. Moi, je suis là. Un petit frère, son nez, son petit. Ça va quelqu'un pour nous aider. Si moi, je reste là toujours, parce que mes petits frères ont besoin de quelque chose, je n'ai pas le moyen pour les aider. Ça va quelqu'un pour nous aider. Pour aussi, je vais manger la mort de ma maman à cause de l'héritage de la vie de manger. Quand on arrive la voyage, je suis le style de paix de ma vie. Ça coûte des salaires, je suis quitté en Côte d'Ivoire. Pour venir au Niger, au Burkina. Au Burkina, je suis venu au Niger. Au Niger, arrivé au Niger, je n'ai plus de l'argent pour continuer mon voyage. J'ai travaillé au Niger pendant trois mois pour chercher un peu d'argent. Le Niger, j'ai un peu de l'argent dans trois mois. J'ai apprêté le voiture pour venir sur le Libye. Le voiture que j'ai apprêté, à la rentrée de Libye, sa destination, son patrimoine en prison. J'ai fait trois mois en prison. Après trois mois, je me suis enfui en prison. J'ai marché pour entrer en Tripoli. J'ai vu des noirs, je les ai demandés. Si je peux trouver un endroit où les noirs sont beaucoup. Donc, ils m'ont dit qu'un quartier à Tripoli, on appelle ça Grigresse. Et si je me mets au milieu des vivants, ils sont arrivés en Italie. Ils ont pris soin de moi, ils m'ont donné un endroit, je dors bien, je mange. Je suis malade, ils s'occupent de moi. Vraiment, je remercie les Italiens pour ce qu'ils ont fait pour moi. Je ne vais jamais les oublier. Si Dieu a fait que j'ai mes papiers en Italie, je vais rester en Italie. Parce que le bien qu'ils ont fait pour moi, je ne vais jamais les oublier. Je vais rester en Italie. Ce n'est pas des diades. C'est les réalités de ma vie que j'ai rencontrées. Je salue tout le monde. Amen. 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 Allez-y, non, salatin saoul. Allez-y, non, yura,
How do we find a good closure for this? <laughs> um, I think I speak for all of us involved uh, in this evening. Just a big thank you. And also not only for the one and a half hours in, in talking and thinking and exploring together, but also sharing your work here. Um, there is much more to explore when it's possible in person, but I highly recommend to visit the website of Western Page, Verena and Andrea, you have so many stunning stuff. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, in that sense. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, we're about to close the Zoom room. Thank you everybody and we wish you a wonderful uh, day and Adventure to live, live like life itself. itself. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Ciao. I think you can close the window. Um.